Today is a sad but uh, predictable day. Bernie Sanders has officially ended his 2020 campaign. Now, I'm not going to come out here and say that I think Bernie Sanders ran a perfect campaign and him and his team did everything they could, everything in their power to win this election. But at the end of the day, it just wasn't enough. I'm not going to lie. That's not what the, the situation is. Yes, they ran an amazing campaign, one of the best campaigns of our lifetime. Their grassroots organization and their people power and their small dollar fundraising, that which shattered records. All those things are historic and precedent setting. And we'll talk about that. And we'll also talk about and we'll also talk about some of the, the fatal mistakes that uh, Bernie's campaign made this time around. There's a lot of criticism to be made. I'll talk about that later. But right now, I think it's important we talk about some of the, the positives from this campaign. One of the most important positive takeaways of Bernie's 2020 campaign, you could also say his 2016 campaign, and just his presence as a political figure here in the United States. He has inspired so many people who may have checked out of politics and... Um, had become jaded by the corrupt status quo business as usual of Washington, D.C. People who see that politicians who are elected to represent us time and time and time and time and time again, they sell out their constituents, they sell out their base, they sell out their voters and serve their corporate donors. They serve the millionaires and billionaires even though their interests are directly, are exactly opposite of the interest of the middle class, the working class, average Americans in this country. Yes, this includes older Americans who've been voting for decades, but this also includes, arguably more importantly, the younger generation, Bernie Sanders' movement. He's, he's led a movement over the last five years that has energized and activated an entire generation of people who may not have looked to become involved in politics at all. A lot of people who never in a million years would have imagined that the issues that are most important to them, whether it's Medicare for all, single payer, or uh, living wage or workers' rights, paid vacation, um, paid parental leave, sick leave, affordable housing, making public college, debt-free, aggressively combating the climate crisis that we're all living under right now. Bernie Sanders showed them with an organized movement, you can force these discussions to be part of the mainstream and to be taken seriously, and that they do actually have a chance of getting these things done that are so incredibly important to them. And because of that, young people followed Bernie Sanders in unprecedented numbers. Which brings me to another positive of Bernie's campaign and this movement that he started or that he's led over the last five years. Bernie's campaign has shown that the left wing in this country is ascending and is a force to be reckoned with. Bernie has amassed a, a unprecedented network of, of grassroots activists Millions of people willing to go to the mat for Bernie Sanders if it meant that the policies that they're fighting for will get to be implemented. In his first week after he announced uh, his 2020 campaign, he had over a million people, a million people signed up to volunteer for his campaign, doing phone banking, sending text messages, knocking on doors, uh, organizing rallies and, and town hall events and that was historic. No one has ever amassed that amount of, of volunteers in such a short period of time. And it was that grassroots support where Bernie derived all his power. That's where all of his power and all of his leverage came from. If that's what made him a real contender in this race, yes, his policies that he um, advocates for are incredibly popular and do attract people. But the work that was done by, again, this network of millions of volunteers, grassroots campaigning that 
every single politician in this country wishes that they can aspire to and cultivate. That's what what gave Bernie Sanders a real shot at becoming president. That's what led Bernie Sanders to break fundraising records, even though he wasn't taking money from corporations, he wasn't taking money from billionaires and millionaires. He still broke fundraising records in every quarter, every month. And like I said, it's not because he had billionaire backers and corporate backers with unlimited amounts of money that they can just throw into a super pack for him. He had regular working class people, bus drivers, teachers, construction workers, retail workers, restaurant workers, factory workers, warehouse workers. All these people donate to Bernie Sanders in mass. Which brings me to the next thing that Bernie said that Bernie and his team get and, and his volunteers get tremendous credit for um, after this campaign. They've changed the face of politics forever. We've changed the face of politics forever. The Before Bernie Sanders ran for president, what was the corporate Democrats, the establishment centrist Democrats, the neoliberals, what was their position on money in politics and, and um, private money funding elections? Their position on paper was, of course, we would love to wake up in a world where we don't have to prostitute ourselves to corporations and to billionaires and millionaires so that we could fund our campaigns. Of course, we would love that because then we'd be more responsive to our constituents. We'd have more time to actually talk to our constituents and um, address their concerns, craft legislation for them, whatever. But unfortunately, that's not the real world. We live in the real world where Republicans are going to raise a whole bunch of money from the, the corrupt oligarch donor class. So in order for us to compete, to stay competitive, to even have a shot at winning elections, we also must prostitute ourselves and sell out our constituents and sell out any values that we have in order to court donors, to fund our campaigns so that we can get elected, even though it's kind of shady, it's kind of corrupt, but that's just the way it is. And there's no changing it. We just have to operate within the system that that we're given. That was the official position of the Democratic Party when it comes to money in politics, private money in politics. We can't give up the corrupt corporate money because we can't unilaterally disarm. That was the Democrats' position. What did Bernie and his movement show? He showed right now in this 2020 race that all of that was a lie. All of that is dead wrong. And if you run a campaign that is responsive to the base of the Democratic Party, responsive to the regular working class voters in this country who are struggling to, to pay their bills, who are struggling to uh, see a doctor or pay for college or buy a house, whatever it is, if you have a campaign that's offering them real solutions, not just hollow, shallow, empty rhetoric and grandstanding and cliches and platitudes, if you run a campaign like that, you can raise all the money you need. You can get have all the volunteers you need. You could have a robust and formidable campaign just simply by raising money from small dollar donors. And sure, maybe the the idea of or, or the grandstanding from the Democratic Party pre Bernie Sanders on the issue of money poli money and politics, maybe it was just disingenuous arguments and they were um, rationalizing their corruption and maybe they really never actually ever wanted to change. Sure, that's possible. But Bernie funding his campaign the way that he did and outraising political juggernauts like the former vice president for Barack Obama, one of the most popular uh, uh, presidents of our lifetime, and all the, the corporate money that he had behind him, billionaires that he had behind him, Bernie was still able to, at some times, double the amount of money that Joe Biden was bringing into his campaign and far outraced everyone else in the race. So that completely completely shatters the argument of what we can't unilaterally disarm because then we'll just we won't be able to run a competitive campaign that blows that excuse completely out of the water 
And it shows people, it shows regular voters, and this might be the most important part, more than proving the Democrats wrong. It shows the voters. We have documented, verified proof. It's in black and white, and it's never going to change. It's, we showed that it's possible to outraise candidates who are backed by billionaires and corporations with just small dollar donations. We showed regular people who thought the system is, is rightfully, they think that the system is corrupt as hell. And they may think that this is the way it is and it's never going to change. Of course, they're going to have to beg corporations and billionaires for money and millionaires for money, but elections cost money and that's the only way to fund elections. Bernie Sanders showed that it's possible to do another way. And he gets tremendous credit for that. On other important issues like Medicare for all, Bernie Sanders completely changed the national discourse on those issues, on that issue. Before Bernie Sanders ran for president um, in, in 2015, I dare anyone to find all the mentions of Medicare for All or single payer in the rhetoric from Democratic politicians or the mainstream media, whether or not they were uh, uh, in, favor it, in favor of it or not, whether they're maligning it or not, they almost never talked about it. They almost never talked about it. And the private health insurance, uh, the corrupt, disgusting, for-profit private health insurance system that we have in place now, that was considered to be grandfathered in to the country. And at no point will it ever change. The uh, furthest this discussion ever went on improving our healthcare system was the Affordable Care Act. Oh, let's put some... Uh, um, couple rules in there so that insurance companies can't fuck you over too hard, but they'll still be able to fuck you over, but just not as hard as they were before. And we will um, have make sure that everybody's required to buy insurance and we you can stay on your, your, your parents' insurance plan until you're 26 and they can't deny you for pre-existing conditions. All these little, those tweaks around the edges, that was considered radical, that was considered pushing the boundaries, and that was considered really as far as the healthcare discussion could go in this country. It was between the wild, wild west, and um, there are damn near no rules for the health insurance companies, or you have um, the far left option in, in, in political discourse, the mainstream discourse at the time, pre-Bernie Sanders, the far left option was, okay, let's do those little tweaks that were in uh, 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 the Affordable Care Act that I just mentioned. Now, Bernie Sanders, it isn't not just him alone. None of this was just him alone. But him and the movement that he was leading through the work online and in rallies and town halls, television appearances, they made Medicare for All single-payer mainstream. It was because Bernie Sanders run in 2016 and the, the amount of uh, uh, support that he got that now it's considered before in this 2020 Democratic primary, it was considered heresy for a, a, a primary candidate to come out and just be against single payer, just flat out be against Medicare for all. They knew the deal. They knew they saw what was up. They saw Bernie Sanders after 2016 doing um town halls. Um, I remember he did a town hall, I think it was for Fox or MSNBC. He was in West Virginia, one of the most Republican states in the country, solid red state. And he was giving a town hall on the importance of Medicare for all, having a single payer health care system. And in that town hall full of Republicans in West Virginia, and, and he's done it in South Carolina, he did it in Texas too. These, these town halls full of the most conservative voters in the country. Here, Bernie Sanders talking about having a government-funded uh, healthcare plan where, ed, where anybody can go to the doctor, anybody can go to the hospital, anybody could get whatever medical attention they need and have to pay nothing out of pocket. And that would cost less than the private health insurance that they're paying monthly for currently. When people, the most conservative voters in this country heard that, they were... With Bernie, there were rounds of applause. Bernie Sanders got standing ovations talk in doing town halls in West Virginia and in South Carolina talking about Medicare for All. Nobody would have thought that was possible before 2015. Simply making the case for it, talking about it, advocating for it relentlessly, like he's been doing for the last 40 years. Bernie Sanders has made it so that every 2020 candidate who got in this race, with the exception of Joe Biden, I think, every single one of them had to come out 
and at least pay lip service to Medicare for all. As time went by, it's clear that it was it was just kabuki theater and they didn't actually mean what they were saying. They didn't actually support single payer. But the fact that they knew they'd be their campaign would be dead in the water if they just came out and said, I'm not going to give you single payer. I don't care if 500,000 people in this country go bankrupt because they can't afford every single year because they can't afford to pay the medical expenses. I don't care if 40 to 50,000 people die every year in this country because they can't go to the doctor, they can't afford basic health care. I don't care if there are tens of millions of people in this country who have insurance or don't have insurance but can't afford to go to the doctor, but still vote for me anyway. They all saw how ridiculous that position was. So even though they didn't mean it, they had to at least try to rip Bernie Sanders on, on, his, most, on his most popular policy position in order to even have a chance in the Democratic primary. And, and another clear, undeniable way that Bernie Sanders has almost single-handedly changed the national discourse on the issue of single-payer Medicare for all. And this is another reason why it was so important for Bernie Sanders to be in this race and why I think he even should have stayed even longer. In the exit polls of almost every single state, one of the questions they asked, and of course they asked it sometimes in extremely hacky ways meant to steer people in a certain direction and make Medicare for all sound crazy, like, oh, would you be willing to eliminate your, your insurance in order to get Medicare for all? And all these other hacky ways that they ask the question to try to steer people away from Medicare for all. And even with the hacky framing, Medicare for all was above 50% or at least the, pl- the plurality in the exit polls for every single state. And I think the only exception might have been South Carolina, one of the most conservative states in the entire Democratic primary. Other than that, every single state, the exit polls show that Medicare for All was more popular than keeping the gross for-profit private health insurance system that we have in place right now. This might be the most extensive polling, at least of the Democratic Party on the issue of Medicare for All, that's ever been done because it was done in the exit polls of every single primary state. And we see that now it's undeniable. It's not up for debate. It's not up for interpretation, Medicare for All is clearly the overwhelmingly popular position, at least for the Democratic Party. And what that means is the position of the Democratic Party, the elected Democrats, should be Medicare for All. And of course, like I said, they're they're not going to do it because they're supported by the private health insurance industry and they're fairly right wing and corporatist and and center right. But it shows that there's a giant disconnect from what the voters of the Democratic Party want and what the establishment elected politicians of the Democratic Party are pushing for. And that is a giant, irreconcilable difference. That's not a small thing. On other issues, um, like the Green New Deal, Bernie Sanders made that mainstream. Nobody, it's incredible that we've been in a climate crisis for decades at this point. Um, the scientists knew, the Democratic Party knew, the mainstream media knew, and nobody has offered any real solid solutions to deal with this. Obama was in office for eight years. He knew there was a climate crisis. He knew the, the existential threat that, cl- that climate change posed to everybody on the planet. He knew that. But where was his comprehensive plan to deal with climate change? It didn't exist. In fact, he was the, the the Barack Obama administration exported more oil, extracted more oil than any other administration in the history of the country. So, and his 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 grand achievement, his big plan on climate change was the Paris Climate Accord. That was uh, 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 his legacy on the issue of climate change, and it was the the Paris Climate Accord was the definition of weak sauce milk toast neoliberal incre- incrementalism the if every country on the planet followed the paris climate accord they would have lowered uh uh, uh carbon emissions by five percent or ten percent how is that going to address the climate crisis that we're in the very same scientist that the that everybody claims to believe is giving the the uh us between 10 and 13 years to get to net zero carbon emissions or face cataclysmic climate apocalypse. Reducing carbon emissions by 5% isn't going to do anything. So if we're being honest, everybody likes to pretend like Donald Trump is, is, is uniquely dangerous on the issue of climate change 
and he if we leave it up to him we're gonna it's it he's not gonna do anything about it but really the democrats were were in office for eight years and they didn't have a plan for for uh uh how to adequately address the climate crisis but bernie sanders he made that a mainstream issue he made the green green new deal a mainstream issue in that green new deal Bernie Sanders, and it's, it, it wasn't just him who came up with it. He took parts of it from Jill Stein's uh, policy platform when she ran in 2016. And he also made some some changes to it, too. But this was the most comprehensive plan to address climate crisis, the climate crisis ever proposed by any politician ever. Uh, nationalizing the energy industry, prosecuting the, the executives and CEOs at, at all these energy companies like Exxon. I don't, know, and sh- I don't know why I'm blinking on, on oil companies. Bernie Sanders' Green New Deal had provisions in there to make sure that every building in the country was retrofitted so that they could go off, uh, uh, so they could s- were no longer relying on power plants that were designed to uh, use fossil fuels so that they could uh, use green renewable energy instead. So Bernie Sanders had trillions of dollars set aside to retrofit buildings. He had trillions of dollars in it for, uh, for infrastructure to, uh, so that we could build electric charging stations for cars across the country. Thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of electric charging stations. Bernie would, Bernie's Green New Deal completely eliminates fracking and oil extraction in the United States as soon as possible, immediately. Nobody else was talking about that. The $15 minimum wage. Here in the United States, we operate, it's, it's, just accepted we we accept the state of wage slavery that we have where people aren't paid a living wage people can go to work work a full-time job work 40 50 60 hours a week and still not have enough money for rent still not have enough money for for groceries or or to pay their bills pay for student loan debts whatever it is we live in a country where wage slavery is accepted it was accepted by both parties the minimum wage had not been raised still hasn't been raised since George W. Bush was president. Hasn't been raised in over uh, uh, 12 years, I think, at this point. Yeah, so it's about 12 years since the minimum wage has, has been raised. The federal min- minimum wage is $7.25. $7.25. There have been multiple studies that show it is impossible to afford even a one-bedroom, a studio apartment, working full-time, getting paid minimum wage. It is literally impossible to inf- afford living anywhere in the country. And what were the discussions being had about how to address this? Well, the Republicans, pre-Bernie Sanders, the Republicans, of course, weren't in favor of raising the minimum wage at all. And the Democrats, their their, uh, uh, big grand solution to fix this, what was it, of course? More more neoliberal incrementalism. And they would have proposed, they were proposing, um, oh, let's do a $9 minimum wage. Oh, wow. Hold up. Don't get the message too much all at once now. $9, $9, Obama was proposing $9 minimum wages. I think the highest that they went after being berated by the left and by, by uh, minimum wage workers, by the end of Obama's time in office, I think he was offering maybe a $10 minimum wage, maybe $11 minimum wage. Of course, he didn't actually put in any legwork or, or use any political capital to make this happen. But his, his rhetoric was, okay, fine, maybe a, a, a $10 minimum wage. That was the discussion that we were having pre-Bernie Sanders. And if you guys have seen the studies uh, about uh, the, how wages have been stagnant since the 80s. So for 40 years, wages have been stagnant in this country. 40 years, uh, uh, they have not kept, kept up with inflation. And because of that, whatever the minimum wage now is worth less than it was a couple of decades ago. And it's not that productivity hasn't increased since the 80s and the 90s. Productivity has shot through the roof. Profit and revenue for these corporations have shot through the roof, but they're not giving it to their workers. So, like I said, like I started this part off with, wage slavery has been accepted in the United States for decades. And Bernie Sanders and this movement has led the charge on $15 minimum wage so much to the point where, and again, it's not just Bernie Sanders, it's him and his millions of volunteers and, and the activists who are also behind this uh, uh, policy platform. They have raised hell. They've done protests. They've uh, primary politicians. They've got elected. They've uh, uh, won seats on city councils, and they fought to ra- to raise minimum wages in in certain states and in cities across the country. 
So a lot of these places that are finally enacting a 15 hour minimum wage, Bernie Sanders and the unions that he supports have led the charge on that fight. And because of that, like Medicare for all, a $15 minimum wage, a living wage, is considered one of those position, policy positions that is just inevitable. It's going to have to happen at some point. So him and his movement, they get credit for that too. So like I said, this is a sad day for a lot of people across the country. And the left has been put in a difficult position and it's still not clear how we're going to get out of this, but... And there's a lot of criticism, like I said, to be made to be levied against Bernie and his campaign. And I'll definitely get into that. You know, I won't be holding back for anybody. That being said, credit where credit is due. Bernie Sanders led a historic movement. And even though he didn't win the nomination, he didn't win a general election to become president. There were still wins there. There were still some positives and... Even though nobody in the mainstream media is going to give Bernie credit for that and uh, establishment politicians don't want to give Bernie Sanders any credit at all for for the work that uh, him and his movement have done over the last five years. I think it's important to try to highlight some of the good things about Bernie's uh, 2020 campaign. 